Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, New Approaches to Antibody Validation and Targeted Protein Quantitation Using Mass Spectrometry, presented by Dr. John Rogers. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher Scientific Incorporated is the world leader in serving science. We help our customers accelerate life sciences research, solve complex analytical challenges, and improve patient diagnostics and increase laboratory productivity. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. I would like to now introduce our speaker, Dr. John Rogers. John Rogers is a senior R&D manager at Thermo Scientific, where he manages the development of new reagents and kits for protein mass spectrometry research. John has an undergraduate degree in biochemistry and computer science and a PhD in pharmacology from the University of Washington. John managed a bioinformatics group at Pfizer and a proteomics group at Abbott before joining the Thermo Fisher Scientific team in 2007. Since joining Thermo, John has led the development of new MS standards and calibrants, protein sample preparation, reagents, and reagents for quantitative proteomic analysis, including tandem mass tag reagents. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Rogers. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Dr. Rogers? Hi, thank you for the kind introduction. And I want to thank everybody for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, I look forward to, uh, uh, to hearing how you, what you think of it. Um, I look forward to any questions. Um, I think you'll find that it's, uh, we've taken a new approach to how we validate our antibodies um, using some tools that we've uh, developed and some novel applications. Uh, so I want to just talk a little bit about what we're going to describe, what I'm going to describe today. Uh, some background on antibody validation and some approaches that have been uh, promoted in the literature in the last few months uh, around pillars of antibody validation. Uh, and then we'll talk about how we, uh, how we choose our cell lines for verifying an antibody, how we screen those, uh, those uh, cell lines and antibodies using mass spectrometry, and then how we analyze the data. So I, uh, so I, again, I, I welcome you to, to uh, participate in any way you, that you choose. Uh, we'd love to answer questions. So there is a critical need for validation of antibodies. You know, whether we look at how much time is wasted or how much money is wasted, um, the problem is is we draw conclusions based on the value of these based on the properties of these antibodies. And sometimes, if the antibodies aren't well characterized, it may actually result in incorrect conclusions. And so we want to help our customers be successful in their work. And we also want to help them be successful in, uh, in how, they, how they get their funding. So it turns out next year, in 2017, a number of funding agencies and major journals will begin requiring details about how the antibody reagents used in, those, in that research uh, were, uh, uh, were characterized. And we want to help our customers with that. So the way we approach this is uh, to follow the guidelines. So in uh, September of 2016, in Nature Methods, this paper was published. It was a proposal for validation of antibodies, and it describes five pillars. Uh, this paper was, uh, was written by a, uh, an ad hoc working group called this International Working Group for Antibody Validation, or IWGAV. And they, uh, they described five pillars of antibody validation. These include genetic, orthogonality, correlation, tagging, and immunoprecipitation to mass spectrometry. So in genetic approaches, uh, we'll have a, a protein that's expressed in a given cell line, and we'll knock down the gene using CRISPR-Cas or, or uh, siRNA, and we'll show, that, uh, we'll show that that signal is specifically reduced. 
With orthogonality, we may have a western blot across a variety of cell models or cell, uh, cell lines. And then we'll have some other method like an ELISA or a mass spectrometry uh, measurement that shows high correlation between the western blot and the orthogonal method. Uh, in a third example, we might have two antibodies, one that's very well characterized as antibody one. And uh, we have another antibody that we, we don't understand very well and we want to understand. And so we'll, uh, we'll show the comparison. And if they're highly correlated, uh, we'll be able to say that we've correlated antibody two based on antibody one. In a, third in a fourth method, uh, we can use a recombinant ex expression system so we can tag a given target for, a, for an antibody and, say, and, and show that the tag co-migrates and is as specific as the antibody against the given, uh, given overexpressed protein. So, so these are all examples of, of, of pillars for antibody validation that were proposed by this working group. They, in the article, they also describe immunoprecipitation as a powerful tool for validation. But frankly, they provide little or no data. Uh, they refer to a previous uh, paper on antibody validation using mass spec, uh, but they don't give a lot, of a lot of guidelines for how one might qualify an antibody. So of all of these, so we're going to talk about that. So of all of these five pillars, it's important to note that only immunoprecipitation with mass spectrometry can truly identify the target, uh, identify off targets, can identify interacting proteins, and can identify protein modifications. So it's really the, the most powerful and flexible tool of this, of this toolbox, and I want to talk more about how we use it. So the approach that we've taken is outlined in the in this summary slide, and we're going to walk through each of these steps in more detail. So the first step that we, in the process was to select our targets. To what, are the, what proteins do we care about? And then uh, what antibodies do we have in our, in our catalog? The second step was knowing those targets, let's identify the right cell line. So it turns out that uh, not every protein is expressed in every cell, and so we have to choose the right cells. Uh, we analyze those cell lines by mass spectrometry. And then once we've identified the right cell lines and shown that we can see the proteins, we then immunoenrich those proteins with a given antibody. We analyze those samples by mass spec, and we analyze that data using some, some bioinformatic tools. And we'll talk in much more detail about each of these steps. So the first step was, how do we choose our genes? So in this case, we went to the library. Uh, and we asked the library to do a search uh, here within Thermo to do a search for how many, how many times a, a given protein was referenced in the literature. And then we summed the number of references, and it turns out that P53 was the mo had the most, sub most citations in, PubMed, uh, in the PubMed database. And it, it's very steep. It, it tails off very quickly, and then it goes out very long. So a lot of proteins. Are, uh, analyzed, are reported very little in the literature, and there's a small subset that are the focus of most of our research. And so we decided to start with that prioritized list. Uh, we then took that, that list of the top 1,000 proteins in the literature. We also added a couple of things on. So uh, Thermo Scientific uh, sells some kits called Ion AmpliSeq. Uh, panels. They're, they're next-gen sequencing panels in which they have PCR primers that amplify regions of particular genes important for cancer or genetic disease. And, they, uh, and, and then they use uh, next-gen sequencing to, to sequence across the regions that are prone to mutation. So we felt that these uh, proteins may also be interesting given their importance at the genetic level. Uh, we then chose cell lines, so we started with the NCI60 and looked at RNA expression data. We also looked at uh, uh, proteomic databases that are available online, uh, uh, proteomics DB and others. And frankly, uh, we found the RNA expression data to be more comprehensive to cover those. Uh, it ended up being about 1,300 protein targets. Uh, we had some cell lines that we had used in some of the development of, our, of some kits that we'd, we'd made, uh, our immunoprecipitation and mass spec kits. And we had some cell lines we'd use to evaluate some pathway development efforts that we have, we've, uh, we've had underway. 
So we had a variety of different cell lines, and then we used mass spectrometry to look at these cell lines. So as I'll describe in the next slide, uh, we chose 12 different cell lines that represent a variety of different, variety of different cancer types. And we uh, grew those cells, we lysed the cells, we prepared the proteins and uh, digested the peptides, and then we analyzed those peptides, either unfractionated straight from the lysate, or we fractionated the peptides with uh, some high pH reverse phase uh, spin columns and identified and quantified all of those proteins. So, so this, this slide just shows some, represent, some representative data. So in this case, we took the 22 genes that are on the ion AmpliSeq colon and lung cancer uh, panel, so the 22 different proteins known to be important in colon and lung cancer, and we looked at the RNA expression data, so this is all available online, uh, you know, publicly available databases. Uh, and the red shows the overexpression relative uh, to the to the median ac across all cell all, all all NCI 60 cells. So if I'm looking for BRAF, it looks like I really need to look in SKMEL cells. If I'm looking for beta catenin, I have a couple more choices. So we went through, and I, we, like I said, we identified 12 cell lines that, based on RNA data, should uh, express at least 90% of those 1,300 proteins. So then we analyzed those by mass spectrometry. So we uh, isolated the, the protein, digested, fractionated, and identified those proteins. Uh, so here are the five least similar cell lines, the data from five of those, so a Venn diagram. So A549, so a lung cancer, a breast cancer, a different breast cancer, a, uh, a, a prostate cancer, and a liver cancer are represented around this Venn diagram. And across these five cell lines, we saw 3,600 proteins across all five. But within each one of those cell lines, we saw an additional five, you know, well, 1,000 or more unique proteins from each of those cell lines. So we used this combination of RNA and protein data to, uh, to characterize uh, these 12 cell lines. And so if we look at uh, just a brief summary of around 80 different targets that are important in cancer. Uh, if I looked at the unfractionated lysate by mass spectrometry, the green represents the proteins that we saw, and the reds are the proteins that we did not see. But after we fractionated so that we could go deeper into the proteome, uh, we were much more successful. So there were relatively few proteins that we were not able to see uh, with, with, with mass spectrometry. And it, they, those may be, it may be that we need to find another cell line or more uh, to capture some of those. So once we've uh, identified uh, these cells and the proteins expressed by them, we can start comparing them. So here's an example of two proteins that are important in the epithelial to mesenchymal transition in cancer. So CDH1, so E cadherin, and CDH2, N cadherin. And if I look at the unfractionated lysates, I could detect cadherin-1 in three different cell lines, uh, HCT116, so a colon, a, a prostate, and a, and a breast cancer. And you'll notice, because of the, they're important for that transition, they're relatively, um, uh, uh, well, the complementary expression profile of uh, N-cadherin, so they're, they're definitely expressed in unique cells. If I look at the fractionated lysates, now I can begin to see uh, let's say A549, I can see both some E cadherin and N cadherin, the cadherin 1 and 2. So some of the things we learned from this is that there is no single cell line that expresses both of these very well, but we do find some expression in a few cell lines. And if I had an antibody that was directed against uh, a pan cadherin, uh, so against all cadherins, I may have to look at multiple cell lines or multiple cell models. To, uh, to verify the, the targets. So once we had identified all of these proteins, we then processed the data through a software package uh, called MaxQuant. Uh, this is a freely available software program from the Max Planck Institute. And not only can it identify the proteins in a mass spectrometry data set, but can also quantify those. And so we can have three different samples. We can analyze those uh, separately by mass spectrometry. And then we can compare the mass spec high-end chromatograms 
to look at the relative protein expression across those three different samples. So in this case, we're looking across 12 different cell lines asking about the expression of close to 15,000 proteins. And so for this, for the studies that, that we were going to describe, that I'm going to describe here, uh, we've used a, a, a metric called protein LFQ, which stands for protein label-free quantitation or quantitative value. So here's an, ex here's an example where we looked at all of the proteins that were expressed in MCF7 and quantified, uh, in this case, by LFQ. So this is a log scale plot of the most, most highly expressed to the least highly expressed detected protein. And across that uh, distribution, we can see that cadherin-1 was uh, you know, midway along that distribution. Uh, if I look at the unfractionated versus the fractionated, we just simply went deeper, and so the cadherin moves uh, into the more, it's more, uh, it, its expression is higher relative to a, a larger set of proteins. So we, uh, we can compare these cell lines, and what we've done is chosen cell lines for our studies in which the target was near or below the median. Uh, our concern is that in some cases people or companies validate their antibodies using cell lines that overexpress the target. And we believe that that's a, a, an inappropriate model for validation. So we want to test our antibodies in real life situations. And so we're choosing cell lines based on the protein expression values. So here's an example of a set of 10 antibodies uh, that we sell. Uh, that are directed against uh, p53. So here's the, the protein LFQ values. So it's, a, it's sort of a unitless uh, uh, quantitation, this label-free quantitative value. And we can see some variation between the different antibodies and the capture of p53. So in this case, we've normalized this. So we use the same amount of antibody. We use the same amount of, uh, of, of beads. Uh, we use the same amount of lysate. And so one of the questions that we're trying to answer is whether the difference, different intensities has, indicates some difference in affinities of these antibodies. Uh, but all of these are validated on our website. They're already listed on our website as IP validated. And all of them were confirmed using our immunoprecipitation to mass spectrometry approach. Okay. So one of the issues with, with the mass spec is that it sees everything. Uh, you know, as opposed to a Western blot or an ELISA, we can't use a blocking agent. We can't put milk on it or BSA. We have to figure out how to deal with all of the proteins that are in a sample uh, that we can detect by mass spectrometry. And so the approach that we've taken is to use this very simple scatter plot. Uh, and I'm just going to I'm going to walk through this. So if I have an antibody against target one that I want to understand, I want to characterize what, what does it capture and what things come along in the immunoprecipitated sample. I can then I can compare it to a control IP, to a different antibody that's maybe a different target, uh, but it, ideally it's isotype matched. Uh, so I'll do an immunoprecipitation with these two different antibodies, and I'll quantify the proteins that were enriched with that immunoprecipitation and I can plot their LFQ values. So on the X and Y axes, I can uh, look at the relative amount of each protein. Okay? And if I plot it on XY scale, uh, with the XY scale, so uh, in the Y dimension, I've got the protein expression with my target antibody. Uh, on the X axis, the protein expression level or the, you know, in the IP, with the negative control antibody, what we find is that all of the abundant or all of the uh, 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 nonspecific proteins are in co that are in common are pulled into the diagonal. And uh, this plot allows me to very easily see the proteins that are specific versus nonspecific. So these are all nonspecific proteins. And these are all specifically captured proteins with my antibody. Okay. So we've looked at that data, and, and it's still a little bit too complex. So then we took the next step. So back in uh, 
back when I was in grad school and, uh, and early on, I, was, uh, I used to purify a lot of proteins. And we characterized the, the uh, performance of our purification by a calculation of fold enrichment. So we do the same thing with our immunoprecipitations. So we've quantified our target in a whole cell lysate. We've quantified that same target um, in our IP. So we can ask, what's the relative enrichment of my protein in my immunoprecipitated sample versus that target protein in the whole cell lysate? And so that's shown here on, the, on, this, on this graph by fold enrichment. So what is, uh, what's shown here is this is an antibody against cadherin-1, and cadherin-1 is right here at the top of the enrich, specifically enriched uh, uh, protein list, and it's colored in green based on this color scale, showing that it's about 50-fold enriched. But you can see that if I had not subtracted those abundant proteins, the, the cadherin-1 would have been masked by some of these abundant sticky proteins that are commonly seen and overwhelm the signal intensity, uh, but are really of, uh, they're really offering no information. They're, they're just background proteins. So we use this approach, this combination of a scatter plot or a, a, you know, a similar methods to subtract background proteins, nonspecific proteins, and then we use the fold enrichment approach to actually quantify how much of the target was, was uh, how well the target was enriched. What's interesting is that not all of these other dots are gray. Some of them are bluish. So uh, the cadherin-1 was 50-fold uh, enriched, and there are some other proteins that were enriched at lower levels. So if I just take this section of the graph and just take this region, and blow it up in the next slide as a bar graph. Uh, we're going to explore this a little more. So what's shown here are the same list of proteins in the previous slide, but now expressed as a bar graph. And so if I take this list of proteins and I paste them into a website called string.org, so this is a publicly available uh, database of uh, protein interaction um, information, I can paste this list in to the string database and it will to the string website and it will return a diagram of the known protein interactions in the public domain. And what you can see in the center of this is cadherin one, and then you can see a number of other proteins that surround it that are known to be important protein interaction partners. So we then color the uh, color the chart to represent uh, the target of interest, so in this case the red is cadherin-1, the target of our antibody, and the blue uh, lines are the enriched proteins that are known interactors based on uh, public databases. So I think what's really most important about this data set is not only do we verify the target, but we also verify that, it's function that the antibody is functionally capturing known protein interactions. And what's really valuable here is that we are not capturing an overexpressed protein, and we're not, ex not capturing tagged proteins. We are capturing the, the actual protein target out of a normal cell line and its interactions with no interferences, with no interferences like an, intera like a, like a, an affinity tag. Um, so these are, these are native protein interactors, and I think this is really valuable. This is going to pr provide really valuable uh, insights and information. Uh, certainly provides much more detail about the quality of an antibody. So as we analyze that data, I can plug that into other, uh, other tools, like uh, uh, there's, a, there's a tool called David or Ease uh, that will calculate gene ontology uh, enrichment, and so uh, you can see that we've enriched a variety of uh, of catenin or beta uh, beta catenin or uh, cadherin complexes, um, and diagrammatically you can see how well uh, the enrichment uh, maps to known complexes. So I think we have some really valuable in, in information that comes out of the mass spectrometer. 
So we can then start to look at more complicated systems that would be very difficult to validate by a Western blot or CRISPR-Cas. Uh, so as an example, uh, we have an antibody, a, a pan-specific antibody to cadherins, and we can see that cadherin uh, 4 and, uh, and 1 and 2 are all enriched. And those are the red, because that was the target. And then we see some direct interactions like beta-catenin. Beta uh, and then we see some, interact, some indirect where they're a little bit further out around the, the periphery. And so we've, in this figure, we've just highlighted them slightly differently. But what's really interesting here is that we saw another protein called TRIM9, this tripartite motif. Uh, and so we asked, well, if cadherin, is, cadherin 4 is enriched 82-fold uh, and cadherins are other cadherins are enriched 30-fold. Why is TRIM9 enriched 53-fold? And so we asked that question. And frankly, the easy way to do it was we typed it into a, a web search, into a Google search. So we just typed in TRIM9 and cadherin. And when we did that, uh, first, pa first paper that came up or right in the top of the list was a paper from 10 years ago where a bioinformatics group had analyze the, uh, the TRIM family and identified uh, the TRIM9 as, a, TRIM9 as a subset of the TRIM family that contains a cadherin domain. So this is consistent with a pan-cadherin antibody capturing a, a, a supposed off-target, but it's actually real uh, because it has a cadherin domain. Uh, as another example, we can cross-validate. So we saw beta-catenin come down with the cadherin antibodies. So now we can capture with, a, with an antibody against beta-catenin and see if we can capture cadherin. So in this example, we compare a variety of antibodies to beta-catenin, looking at their LFQ values across a, a number of different antibodies. Not all of these listed the antibody as web, uh, well, in this case, all of them were listed on their web as IP validated, and we, we saw all of the targets. But you can see the uh, intensities vary quite a lot. So we're still trying to understand the, the cause of that, but uh, definitely identifying the target, verifying the target. What's interesting, though, is that if we then compare the results of these antibodies, well, first, let's, let's just take one. So here's, uh, the, here's one of those antibodies, the one with the highest expression level. We can see beta-catenin was enriched about 180-fold. Uh, we see a number of other protein interaction partners in, in this blue or purple color. And one of them is APC that was enriched 300-fold. Well, that kind of surprised us. And so we dig, did a little bit more digging. And it turns out that APC has 11 uh, beta-catenin binding motifs in its sequence. and Frankly, it's very hard to see APC in the cell line until after, you know, when, we, when we screened it by mass spec. But after enrichment with a beta-catenin antibody, now the APC is very easily seen, very uh, high sequence coverage, uh, clearly uh, highly enriched. So, it captures, so this antibody not only captures beta-catenin, it captures known com complex partners like APC, uh, as well as uh, alpha uh, catenin and uh, let's see, I know we've got some, some cadherins in here. Yeah, cadherin 1 and 3 right here. So they're relevant and we can cross-validate our results. Another interesting thing we can do is uh, show uh, uh, complementarity of all those antibodies. So what I'm showed here, showing here is the fold enrichment of each of those interaction partners that came down. So we have beta-catenin, uh, and then we have the partners that were co-immunoprecipitated and quantified by mass spectrometry. So we have APC, we have CDH3 and 1, um, and on down the list. And so if I, if I, just by looking at this, I'm actually supporting another, uh, another antibody validation pillar, which is complementarity. I'm showing uh, similarity of my mass spec data across a variety of, of antibodies. I can map all of these into the, in, into the interaction network, like I've shown previously. And then I can actually start to cluster the fold enrichment information. And I get some really interesting results. 
So what's shown here is, uh, in this case, we had 14 different antibodies against uh, beta-catenin. And there were some antibodies that enriched most of, well, let me change my icon here. We had some antibodies that enriched one set of proteins. If I change my color. So that was one cluster. If I have another set of antibodies that enrich a different cluster, and one antibody that actually grabbed all of them, all of the known interaction, all of the the largest superset. So uh, we actually see a very strong correlation between the antibodies, but we also see some uniqueness between those antibodies, suggesting that these different antibodies may interact with the, with the beta-catenin in some unique way, so suggesting there may be some unique epitopes. And we could actually classify those, those uh, those epitopes uh, using the mass spec results. So uh, just in summary, uh, I hope I've convinced you that immunoprecipitation to mass spectrometry is a key pillar in this uh, IWGAV uh, approach or uh, uh, recommendation. So what I've shown you is that we can verify the target and identify known uh, either off targets that were you know that we can explain or understand. Uh, we, can, uh, we can characterize pan-specific antibodies. We can characterize, uh, you know, we're working on anti-PTM-directed antibodies. So this is a very powerful approach to validating an antibody. Um, as, uh, as you could clearly see in the, the previous data, I hope, uh, we can use publicly available information to show that we are enriching native interacting proteins uh, with our antibodies. And if we look closer into the mass spectrometry data, we can actually identify the peptides of those target proteins that were identified, uh, as well as modifications to the sequence, such as by phosphorylation or glycosylation. So very powerful approach that provides a unique set of information. We can also quantitatively compare antibody performance. As I, as I showed, we have a set of large number of antibodies against, uh, you know, we have a lar large set of antibodies that have unique features. And understanding these by mass spectrometry is going to provide much more insight into how these antibodies could be used uh, in unique ways. Um, so I just wanted to summarize. We have, uh, at this point, we've actually uh, screened over 600 antibodies. Uh, we find overall our success rate using immunoprecipitation to mass spectrometry is about 57%. If an antibody has, is, is annotated as uh, validated by mass spec, or I'm sorry, validated by immunoprecipitation, uh, typically we see a 70% success. If an antibody does not say that it was, that it is validated for immunoprecipitation, uh, it's t we typically see about, um, 40% uh, success. So we're not just focused on antibodies that have been previously validated for mass spectrometry. Uh, as I said, immunoprecipitation to mass spec verifies the antibody target, and it provides a great deal of additional information about antibody performance. And this approach of using fold enrichment provides a very simple way to verify antibody performance and assess interactions and off targets. So this data is just beginning to appear right on our website now. So here's an example with P53 where we found almost, well, over 3,000-fold enrichment of P53 with a given antibody. And we see a couple of other background proteins um, and some known interactions. Um, so this, we are just beginning to, uh, to share all of these results with our customers. So, uh, if you visit our website at thermofisher.com slash antibodies, you'll find that we offer more than 50,000 in vitrogen antibodies. These, antibody, these primary antibodies uh, are against you know, tens of thousands of, tar you know, tens of, thousands of, of, uh, of targets. And uh, you'll see if, you, uh, if, you, if, in the if in the top of the search screen, if you just type in a star, an asterisk, and hit return, 
it actually, the website actually now sorts so that proteins that have been verified using mass spectrometry are at the top. So here's just a very simple screenshot of some of the beta-catenin antibodies that I've described in the last few slides. Uh, and if you click on the link for the mass spec verified target, it'll provide more information on, on the cell line and how the antibody was used. And, and from there, a further link takes you to a white paper that describes our antibody validation approach in more detail. So all of this work is actually done using products that we sell. So we didn't make any of this stuff up. We use, we use the tools that we, we, we make uh, for customers. So uh, for the majority of this work, we use the mass spec compatible magnetic uh, immunoprecipitation kit uh, with protein AG uh, with all of the buffer components. Uh, we just followed the instructions. Uh, we've done a lot of work with some of these with these antibodies to also biotinylate them with our biotinylation kit, and then using those biotinylated antibodies with our streptavid and coated magnetic beads in the, in a similar magnetic uh, immunoprecipitation kit. Uh, low protein binding tubes uh, for mass spec workflows to eliminate losses from these low protein amounts. Uh, quantitative tools like our colorimetric peptide assay, so we know how much peptide we're putting onto our mass spectrometer. And for the deep proteome analysis of those 12 different cell lines, we used our IPH reverse phase peptide fractionation kit. So we're using the, t the tools that we've developed over the last, number, last several years to, uh, to, to build on our understanding of our antibody uh, portfolio. So with this, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, this is the work of a very powerful group, a, a group that works for me, uh, Bhavan Patel, Greg Potts, Lee Connor, and others. Uh, the help of a bioinformatician within Thermo, uh, John Bucci, that's been really, uh, that, that really helped us simplify these calculations of fold enrichment. And then working very closely with our antibody group uh, based here in the US and in uh, Bangalore, India, on uh, identifying best practices and uh, um, the, the right tools to verify our broad portfolio of antibodies. So with that, I would welcome any questions, and I would like to thank you for your, for your time. Um, and I'll hand it back over to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Rogers, for that informative presentation. It is time for Q&A. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask Dr. Rogers, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions that we have time for. Okay, let's get started here. Our first question is, Dr. Rogers, why do fold enrichment values vary between antibodies targets? Well, I mean, we calculate fold enrichment based on the abundance of that protein in the cell lysate and the abundance of that protein in the immunoprecipitated sample. So um, as, as I stated, not every protein is expressed in every cell, and even if it's expressed in two different cell lines, it may be at a different level. And so we, we use the actual protein expression levels relative to the whole cell lysate to calculate fold enrichment. So every time we look at a different cell line um, or use a different antibody and, um, and ha that may have a slight difference in, it, in its affinity, uh, we may see some slight difference, some differences in the fold enrichment. But we do think it, uh, that fold enrichment provides really valuable insight into the performance of the antibody. Okay. Do background proteins overlap between different antibodies, cell lines, and how does that affect fold enrichment? Well, we actually include, we don't remove the, the background proteins until after we've calculated fold enrichment because otherwise it would skew our fold enrichment. Uh, but we do, but background proteins, uh, some of them bind to the tubes and to the beads. Some of them may bind to the antibody uh, because even when we use isotope, isotope matched, uh, we see certain proteins that, that bind. Uh, so it's really going to vary. Uh, how important those background proteins are, and it, it just emphasizes our need to have the right controls. Now, Dr. Rogers, why does the fold enrichment of inter interactors or background proteins sometimes appear greater than the actual antibody targets? 
Well, you know, we, I showed an example with APC where the, uh, the, the interacting protein had a significantly higher fold enrichment than the target. And I guess that refers to both uh, the skew because that interacting protein was so difficult to see prior to enrichment. And after enrichment, we had so much more sequence coverage and uh, mass spec intensity that uh, we had so much more signal that it showed up as you know, much more highly enriched. Um, so a lot of it has to do with the, uh, uh, the abundance of that protein in the whole cell lysate. Um, it also says something about the tightness of the interaction. So when a protein like APC has so many different binding uh, interaction domains for a given uh, uh, target, uh, in this case beta catenin, um, I think that also skews it, skews the fold enrichment data uh, to, you know, to much higher levels. Uh, so that's, you know, maybe that's a drawback of this approach, but this is the data. Um, and, you know, I, my goal is to get the best data and to dry, uh, draw, draw conclusions from that. Dr. Rogers, what are you going to do about the antibodies that don't work? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think we're still figuring that out. We, uh, we haven't seen a lot of antibodies that don't work, um, but the ones that don't, what we've done, is, what we're doing is collating that list and comparing uh, the results from this immunoprecipitation to mass spec approach with uh, other validation approaches like uh, siRNA or CRISPR knockdown. And uh, what we're trying to do is, you know, consolidate that information. And the goal here is to identify antibodies that don't work so that we can remove them from our catalog. You know, we want our customers to be happy and to be satisfied with, their, with our products. And so it's important for us to, to, get, to get rid of the bad, the bad um, and highlight the good. So. Now, what are the drawbacks of IPMS for antibody verification? Well, you know, it, it, you have to buy a mass spec, so there's uh, there's some cost involved. Uh, there is some uh, there's a little bit of expertise here, but we've tried to take a lot of that out with uh, some simplified kits. So, so there's a method to it. Um, I think one of the, you know, in, in terms of the data analysis, a couple of things we found is that when we filter with the scatter plot approach. Um, it, 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 we actually need a couple of different antibodies to subtract some of the really abundant background proteins. Sometimes we don't always remove those. It's, I'd rather underfilter than over, uh, but sometimes we'll look at that list and you'll, we'll clearly see, you know, five or six proteins like supervillain or a ribosomal protein or myosin that they, they show up in other IPs, but they didn't necessarily get subtracted uh, with the control that we used. So there's a little bit there. Uh, and then the other thing that we're still struggling a little bit with is we have a lot of proteins that we did not see in the deep dive, uh, but we saw after the enrichment. And so we cannot calculate fold enrichment for those interactors. Uh, and, you know, we can't, and, and even though we know that, you know, based on the public database, there, there's probably some interaction there, the problem that we've seen is uh, there are some proteins that, we can't calculate fold enrichment because we never saw them in the deep dive. And that's uh, good or bad, it's pretty interesting. So, If one wants to see the interaction between two proteins by immunoprecipitation, how can one validate co-immunoprecipitation? Oh, that, I mean, the standard method is to cross-validate. So if, uh, like I showed here, if I saw beta catenin in my cadherin pull-down, um, I go back and see if uh, cadherin shows up in my beta catenin pull-down. Uh, I think that's the best strategy. Dr. Rogers, we have an audience member with, who would like to know if you could provide the website for the RNA of NCI60. NCI yeah, yeah, I, I think it's called Cell Miner, C-E-L-L-M-I-N-E-R. Uh, but it's a public database of, uh, it's got RNA expression data, it's got some uh, uh, protein, some uh, uh, proteoarray proteo data, uh, it's got uh, data from screens with different small molecule inhibitors. There's a ton of data on the Cell Miner website, and it's all available for free download. So. We have great questions coming in today. 
Dr. Rogers, do fractions mean organellar fractionation to enrich protein presence? Uh, no, I, we have not been using organellar uh, enrichment. When we fractionate, we're using the high pH reverse phase columns, and so what we do is we take the lysate, we reduce alkylate, we digest with trypsin, and then we take those peptides and we apply them to a, uh, a, a reverse phase column. It's actually just the little spin column uh, in our kit. And, uh, and then we wash, uh, you know, we desalt, and then we elute with step fractions uh, at a high pH uh, with increasing amounts of acetonitrile. And then we take those, those fractions and dry them down and redissolve them in our sample buffer. And we might quantify with our peptide assay, and then we put them onto the mass spec. Um, and you know, we, in this case, we only collected eight fractions uh, per cell lysate, um, and uh, it allowed us to, to more than double the, the, uh, the number of, or about double the number of identified proteins. How predictive is native IP for performance of antibodies in WB, IHC, and IF? Well, you know, I, I think that's yet to be determined. The, uh, the publication uh, from um, Ellett Edwards' group uh, showed some data with their immunoprecipitation, the mass spec approach, uh, showed that, it all, that many of these antibodies also work for immunofluorescence. Um, and so a few other applications I showed some data with Western blotting. You know, I think one of the other applications we have not tried yet is there are actually approaches for uh, denaturing uh, your target prior to the immunocapture. Um, we could do that. We kind of like the idea of seeing interactions, uh, but uh, I think there are a lot of other ways that we could apply this strategy uh, to gain, you know, to, to access you know, maybe let's say we have an antibody that only works against a denatured target. I think there are ways that we could we could use this this approach in in those cases. What kit did you use to immobilize your antibody for the IP? Uh, well, as I referred to in one of the later slides, uh, we did not immobilize the antibody. Frankly, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, we uh, as as Thermo Fisher and Life Technologies merged. Uh, my group, uh, we spent, spent quite a bit of time evaluating all of the resins that are, were at the time sold by Thermo Scientific and Life Technologies, uh, all the Dynal beads, all of the, the, the Pierce beads, and, and asked, does it, does, what's the best approach? Should I immobilize my antibody using um, you know, epoxy or amine reactive beads like Aminolink, or should I uh, biotinylate it? Should I immobilize with, you know, maybe I capture with protein AG and then cross-link it? Um, should I uh, modify the sugars and, and immobilize through glycolinks? Uh, we tried all of these different approaches, and what we found was that uh, the most robust uh, and, uh, frankly, the best performing method uh, was to either use protein AG-coated beads or to biotinylate the antibody and use uh, streptavidin. Um, it had the highest sequence coverage and the lowest background, um, you know, variety, in a wide variety of different targets. Uh, the issue that we have with crosslinkers in an immobilization, uh, with crosslinkers, we see some antibodies that are just frankly modified and uh, irreparably damaged by the crosslinker, um, probably because there's a lysine in the active site. Uh, we have other examples where one of the issues we have with background proteins, we want to minimize those. You know, like I said, we don't have a blocker, and so we want to minimize. And so what we do is we pre-incubate the antibody with the lysate. We might let that go overnight at 4 degree, and then we'll add the, add the beads, in this case a magnetic bead, and we'll only incubate for an hour. And what we find is that if we immobilize the antibody, we have to incubate the bead with that antibody on it, with that lysate overnight, and it's just an opportunity for all kinds of background to develop. Um, so we really try to, to, uh, to separate those two steps so that we get the best protein, you know, antibody target interaction first, and then we uh, go in and quickly grab that interaction uh, with our bagdetic beads. Dr. Rogers, can samples preserved with trizole be quantified using IP mass spec? Oh, uh, with trizol? Uh, no, trizol is going to completely denature those proteins, um, and that buffer is pretty incompatible. So, 
you know, maybe uh, maybe if you were trying to capture um, denatured targets, like I said, there there may be a way to do that, but I think that uh, trisol uh, solubilized proteins are going to be kind of uh, uh, inaccessible with with an antibody capture. What type of mass spec can be used to characterize antibodies? Um, one that one that works. <laughs> Frankly, uh, you know, it doesn't it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. This what I've shown here, you know, I I'd like to think of this as it's elegantly simple. The approach that we've taken with the background subtraction and the fold enrichment, uh, the only issue that you'll have is uh, if your if your instrument is not sensitive enough to see the target in the in the wholesale lysate, then you're not going to be able to calculate fold enrichment. So, in this case, all of these studies were do, done with the Q Exactive HF. Um, or a Q exactive uh, QE plus. Um, a lot of some of the cell lysates uh, we've also run them on a on a Orbitrap fusion instrument. Uh, but frankly, the the QEHF did uh, did it was close enough that uh, it was more than adequate. Now, what is the criteria you apply to say an antibody antibody that is poor, good, or great in IPMS? Is it a combination of fold enrichment with a certain number of interactor proteins versus off-target proteins? Uh, I, you know, frankly, this is uh, this has been a work in progress. We uh, we started on this effort in February, uh, so it's been a pretty uh, pretty fast jaunt, uh, and I think we're still trying to figure out well what's the best uh, what's the best uh, antibody. Uh, we have done a little bit of work with these uh, these antibodies and. The different intensities that we see appears to be dependent on the off rate, the dissociation rate constant, um, and not necessarily on the overall affinity. Affinity is kind of weird with antibodies because you've got two binding domains, and so the association rate constants are affected by both of those domains. Uh, but what we do see is that this, this does seem to give an indication of the relative off rates of those antibodies. So you, want, you basically would like to have a slow off rate. What is the equilibrium disassociation dissociation constants KD for the affinity purified ABS? You know what? I can answer that, but I haven't looked. I, I haven't looked at the data recently enough to be able to say what those numbers are. Um, you know, most of the. I think the uh, the overall affinities were, you know, in the low nanomolar, but I don't remember the specific numbers. Let's. See, we have so many great questions coming in. Um, let's see, Dr. Rogers, how long does each MS analysis take? Uh, right now, we're running. Uh, what we do is we do the we do a replica pull downs. So we'll do two separate pull downs out of the lysate and process those, and we'll analyze those. Each one of them is a sixty or seventy minute LC run, uh, and then we'll run a, a blank between samples. So it takes about two hours uh, to analyze the duplicates, and then another half hour to to uh, wash off background so that we can move on to the next antibody. Very good. And let's see. Um, here's another question: What are those relative off rates? Uh, as far as the quantitative value, I, I, again, I can't remember the exact numbers, um, so I, I, I'd have to take that offline. Okay, very good. And then here's a question of clarification. Um, so out of all the approaches like cross-linking or protein AG beads, biotinylation is the best, is that so? Well, frankly, biotinylation has is you know it's uh, uh, it has benefits and drawbacks. So the benefit is that biotinylated antibodies um, have the lowest background. Um, when we capture with those, we can wash uh, a little bit more stringently, um, and uh, we can we can use uh, you know you can't use protein AG in in plasma samples. So if I was trying to do uh, uh, immunocaptures out of plasma, I wouldn't be able to use protein AG because it would be swamped by all the antibody in the, in the, in the serum. Um, so, so we like biotinylated antibody, we like using biotinylation. 
It also allows us to multiplex. So we, we've done examples where we've uh, put together 12 different antibodies to uh, directed against a whole pathway um, and captured all the targets at once using streptavid encoded beads. Uh, we don't have enough capacity uh, and the background is a little bit higher with protein AG. So uh, there are certain places where biotinylation really, really stands out. The downside of biotinylation is that you have to get an antibody that's carrier free. And you know, some of these antibodies have carrier in them and so you have to uh, you know, request a special order uh, to get the antibody without carrier. So trade-offs. Well, we are almost out of time. That will have to be our last question. I would like to once again thank Dr. John Rogers for his presentation. Dr. Rogers, do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, no, actually, uh, well, yeah. I, uh, so my email is john.rogers at thermofisher.com. Um, we're, uh, we're kind of excited about this approach. It's, pretty di it's, it's a new way to uh, characterize antibodies. And frankly, right now, I think we're trying to figure out, you know, does it work? What, do people think this is going to be useful? Uh, what are the weaknesses? You know, we're, we're certainly evaluating those. Uh, but I'd like to hear others' thoughts um, and any feedback. Thank you once again, Dr. John Rogers. And thank you to our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's broadcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 8, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. We thank you for joining us and hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>